Hi and welcome back. If you're new to the channel, my name is Vince. Thanks for stopping by. You're very welcome here indeed. So in his latest interview, David Sinclair, Harvard professor and author of the book Lifespan, has explained his theory of aging. He shares parts of his personal health routine and reveals which direction in today's aging research actually excites him the most. In the longevity field, when it comes to name recognition, there's David Sinclair and then there's all the rest. But as in many other areas of life, this gap in popularity doesn't necessarily reflect the actual professional hierarchy. Dr. David Sinclair, a Harvard professor, is undoubtedly a very prominent aging researcher. But I'm sure he would probably agree that he has many, many equally worthy colleagues. Dr. Sinclair is one of the most visible longevity advocates, expertly broadcasting the message of life extension from top tier platforms such as Joe Rogan's, Andrew Huberman's and Rhonda Patrick's podcasts. But this does not mean he's completely morphed into a public figure. On the contrary, he and his team at Harvard continue to produce some of the most interesting results in the field of longevity. He is one of the pioneers in practical applications for partial cellular reprogramming, having demonstrated it can regenerate crushed optic nerves in mice and in non-human primates. He answered many, many questions during this latest interview, but I've selected just a few that appear to go beyond the old favorites. First was, you possibly have the highest media profile and name recognition in the field, so your voice bears a lot of weight. What are your thoughts on the current situation with longevity advocacy? David Sinclair replied, we have a long way to go. Most people haven't heard of aging research or the results that are being produced. Most doctors are also unaware of the advances in the field. And I, for one, have encountered this firsthand. I spoke to more than five different doctors, all of whom did not want to prescribe metformin as a preventative. The one that did finally say yes, recommended I cut a 500 milligram tablet in half and take only 250 milligrams per day. I had to take the initiative and increase my dose while also monitoring my blood sugar levels. Now I'm not recommending that you do that, I'm just saying that's what I had to do to bring down my A1C levels. And I am not alone. Many who have commented on this channel have asked how to get around an antiquated MD who knows nothing about supplements and really just wants to deal in drugs. And as well as having very little training in nutrition, with many medical schools offering less than the recommended 25 hours of nutrition education in the four years of medical school. When it comes to dietary supplements, such as vitamins, minerals, herbs, and other substances taken to supplement the diet, the coverage is even more variable and often far less comprehensive. Now, some medical schools may include discussions on the efficacy, safety, and regulation of dietary supplements, but this is not universal, and your MD may have had close to no training whatsoever. It's generally agreed that there's a lack of standardization in how dietary supplements are covered in medical education, leading to a variability in doctor's knowledge and their comfort level in discussing these products with their patients. Please let me know in the comments below if your MD displays limited knowledge or interest in things such as NAD boosters or using any kind of supplement to improve your health span. Dr. Sinclair was then asked, recently you've said things like there's no upper limit on human aging. You've discussed reaching longevity escape velocity as a real possibility. Just a few years ago, this would have raised a lot of eyebrows in the field. What has changed? He answered by saying, there is no known upper limit. Doesn't mean we can't live for decades or even centuries longer. I don't know of any technology that would allow longevity escape velocity currently. But I also know that saying something is impossible is a dangerous thing in this time of human history. Longevity escape velocity is a theoretical concept. The term was popularized by the futurist Ray Kurzweil and is further associated with the work of Aubrey de Grey. It refers to a point in time in which medical technology advances so rapidly that for every year that passes, at least one year is added to the average life expectancy of individuals, effectively outpacing the aging process. David Sinclair says we're not there yet, but advises against saying that it is impossible. And I'm sure that the David Sinclair skeptics or the haters, those that prefer to focus on his business dealings and not 
his scientific achievements, of which there are many, will find a way to negatively spin this too. But then I suppose that's life. Then he was asked, what recent developments and discoveries in the longevity field are you most excited about? He answered, I'm excited about senolytics, epigenetic reprogramming, and the use of AI in healthcare. And if you regularly watch the channel, you know I take two senolytics, fisetin and quercetin, and I break my supplements down into two classes, if you like. The ones that can be measured and then can be adjusted for dosages, etc., such as vitamin D or metformin for my blood sugar levels or DIM for my estradiol. And then the second class, which is really more of an educated guess, these are those that can't easily be measured, preventatives such as senolytics, NAD boosters, hyaluronic acid, CERT6 activators, and that's just to name a few. And this second class with regard to efficacy can also be questioned. So if I die 95, did they help me because I was destined to die 85? Or did they make no difference at all because I was always going to die at the age of 95? Or did they have a negative effect because actually I was going to live to be 100? We will never know. My experiment is N of 1. There is no Vince control group. So I ask you to keep an open mind. Seek out many sources of information. Don't just listen to the skeptics, especially the so-called longevity influencers who are young, have the theory, but don't really know what it's like to be old. And as far as AI and healthcare is concerned, the skies are the limit. The more I use AI, the more I'm becoming a massive, massive fan. The number of studies I also see posted online showing that AI is regularly outperforming MDs when it comes to passing medical examinations and recommending diagnoses for a list of symptoms is increasing by the month. And I think signs like these, often seen in doctors' offices or on their Twitter pages, may soon need to be quietly removed. Now, I found this next question very interesting indeed, which was, you describe yourself as a struggling vegan and practice intermittent fasting. Are those two things firmly backed by science or do we only have anecdotal evidence for them? David Sinclair answered, I'm not simply relying on anecdotes. Changing my lifestyle has resulted in changes to my blood biomarkers that are consistent to long-term health. Vegan diets are considered some of the healthiest of all. And this is backed by multiple human studies. He went on, skipping meals so my eating window is shorter, which is what I try to do, is backed by evidence indicating that it improves metabolic health and lowers inflammatory markers, among other benefits. So what do I think? I think his transition to veganism has a lot more to do with his new life partner, who is vegan, than the multiple human studies that he's spoken about. These epidemiological studies haven't just been published. He's had access to them for many years, unlike his new vegan partner. I do agree with him, however, about time-restricted eating. I'm now pretty much OMAD, one meal a day, five days a week. He was then asked about taking rapamycin and metformin. In that, given that the human data is insufficient and that metformin is contradictory, how can we know that these two drugs are safe and effective, especially in combination? David Sinclair answered, we know their safety profile. Metformin has been in tens of millions of people. Metformin and low-dose rapamycin appear to be relatively safe. Whether they are effective at slowing aging and safe in combination is not yet known. So I don't take rapamycin. I do take metformin. Some would say I'm taking a chance by taking one gram of metformin a day because I'm not yet diabetic. But I prefer to prevent as opposed to treat. I, like many that I talk to, wish they'd never fallen for the lies about the money-generating low-fat diets, nearly all full of ultra-processed foods, most of which were recommended by organisations funded by the same companies that produce this processed garbage, which raises blood sugar levels and induces chronic levels of inflammation. But, unfortunately we did, but some of us have learnt our lesson. I urge you to seek advice from multiple sources. Don't just listen to the MDs with their 25 hours or less of nutrition training. There's no one right human diet for longevity for human beings, save the one that has no ultra processed foods in it. Try vegan, try carnivore, try vegetarian, try keto, try skipping breakfast, try the 5-2 diet, try 16-8 time restricted eating, try water fasting, try the fasting mimicking diet, try it all to see what works for you. I'd be interested to see in the comments below if you've come across an MD stuck in the dark ages just wanting to deal in drugs. Are you taking rapamycin or uh, metformin or any kind of supplement for that matter 
as a preventative? And if you are, what are you taking and why? I'd be interested to see. And have you seen or felt any particular benefits?